Welcome back, Joystick Justice League. I'm Mike Fursios, and wow, it's been two months. This is a new show. It's called JJL Live. Why am I back? Why am I doing videos again after kind of disappearing for two months? Well, I mean, there's a lot to talk about. Let, let's just uh, let's set the tone right now. It took me two months to press the record button on this camera I'm talking to right now. There's a lot going through my head. I've got about 18 pages of notes. Headlines, scenarios, thoughts, things that are delighting me, things that are pissing me off. But uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna break this down. JGL Live is the new direction of the Joystick Justice League. I really want to take this network back to where I originally intended it to go, back to the basics. I always intended this to be kind of like an AM radio talk show, like about an, an hour long, maybe half an hour, we'll start with a half an hour, we'll see where the go show goes from here, how far I can get through with doing this on one take, that's why it's called JJL Live, it's just me pretending I'm on the radio like I used to do back when I was like 19, 20 years old, back on campus radio, what was great about doing it back then was that when you're out live on the radio airwaves, you get one shot, just like you know Eminem used to say, one shot, one chance to blow, right, you don't get to do a take two. So that's what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to slow down, breathe a bit more, talk less out of my throat, more out of my gut, you know, the way you're supposed to, and just have fun with this. You know, that, that was really what the whole point of me doing this in the first place was not only to inform people about video games based on my, my 30 plus years of experience with the medium, but also to do it in an entertaining way that's fun to listen to while you're Clean, cleaning the bathroom or, or making a sandwich or something like that. You know, you can just throw this on in the background. And that's why I'm going audio based for this new show. Depending on my schedule, you know, I work like everybody else. Depending on my schedule, I may actually cut some video clips and some headlines to go along with what I'm saying right now. But I'm not making any promises. Again, it took me two months to press this record button and to feel comfortable talking in front of this camera again. Um, so here we go. This is JJO Live, episode one. Basically, the whole premise is that we'll s news kind of stops happening around mid-afternoon on a Friday. You know, you'll see a little bit of stuff on the weekend, but generally, all the major video game news happens Monday to Friday. So I'm just gonna kind of compile all that stuff, and by the time we hit the weekend, depending on my work schedule, I'll sit down. We'll go over the week, talk about what's going on in games, what's going on in issues. All from like my kind of admittedly politically charged perspective. In the in the interest of transparency, which has been on on the minds of gamers everywhere for the last two months since the infamous GamerGate um, movement, famous infamous, depending on how you look at it, um, happened at the end of August, and that's basically one of the major reasons why why I kind of hid away for the last two months. I didn't make any videos. A lot went through my mind. And at the same time, I had the double whammy of, of my co-host finding a new direction and a new gig that he had to do. So uh, Joe has now officially uh, left the Joystick Justice League. We do thank him for, we talking as if there's more than me. I thank him, I thank you Joe personally for your contribution to the network. And I wish you the best of luck at Energy Rocks Radio. You can catch Joe on Twitch TV, uh, I believe, uh, 8 a.m. to 12 p.m., somewhere around there, on the Energy Rocks Radio channel for Twitch. So that's where Joe's off to. So I dealt with that. I'm over it now. I wish him the best. Gamergate happened, all right? So I'm not going to sit and try to describe Gamergate to you in, like, what do I got, 10 minutes? I'm, I'm, I'm breaking the show down mathematically now because I want to put out like segments that equal up to an hour of about 15 to 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes each. So this first segment, I'm calling, calling the Greek Speaks. It's a new segment I'm going to be doing pretty much weekly where I talk about, I, I give my perspective on maybe like a hot 
button issue in the gaming industry or something to that effect. That I'm, I'm still playing with it, but I feel that calling it the Greek speaks, you know, I'm of Greek descent, um, kind of gives you the attitude of this show. And, and I mentioned how I'm kind of politically charged. I'm not going to make any, uh, I'm not going to try to hide it. I'm very active on Twitter. You can follow me at, at DFLBagBoy, at DuffelBagBoy. But tread with caution, okay? Like, I'm not, I don't just talk about video games. I talk about a lot of things, especially politics and from a certain perspective. If you want, you can, you can play the, the label game all you want. You can, you can try to put me in a box. I'm going to tell you right up front that I am, I, I, I lean li to, in a libertarian fashion. I believe I'm a humanist. I'm also of Christian descent. So that can kind of give you an idea of how, what I feel about morality in the sense that, yes, I may have the big dreaded C word of being a Christian, but I also do believe in equality. And I also do believe in individual freedom and, and the right to choose. So consider me kind of centrist. And, and really, one, it's funny because one time I came up with, I found something on Wikipedia of all places that almost perfectly describes me. And I hope I don't regret to say this one day, but a South Park Republican. Look it up. I kind of like that. That kind of makes sense to me. Maybe that's why I, I'm so obsessed with South Park because I just identify with Matt and Trey's politics. So those are my politics. I try not to bring politics too much into my gaming discussion, but here's the here's the secret, people. And, and here's the thing: people have told me that you shouldn't mix my you shouldn't mix gaming and politics. You'll alienate you'll alienate your audience, Mike. Everything is political. Okay, I gotta thank my my first year university film prof, Dr. Angela Stacator. For, like this was like on the first day of school, man. Like I had film 101 or whatever, or film one or whatever it was back in University of Western Ontario I went to. My very first day of film studies, we were gonna watch, um, I think it was The Matrix. Was it The Matrix? Anyway, but the first thing Angela Stacator said was that the first thing you're gonna learn in film studies is that every film you watch is political. And you could hear like this hush, or like kind of a gasp, a collective gasp in the lecture room, it's like, and, and you know, already people are like, what do you mean like every film is political? Are you trying to say Dumb and Dumber is political? Are you trying to tell me that, you know, like Caddyshack is political? And once you, and, and you know, obviously the message is that yes, every film, every piece of art, every medium, every video game, every song is born of a political context. So taking us back to video games, everything that comes out as a video game is born of a political context. And you're seeing that more and more. And that's why... I really got us now just draw my line in the sand and that you know I don't care how many dislikes this video gets, I don't care how many people people talk smack about me in the comments, I support Gamergate, hashtag Gamergate, hashtag not your shield, and the somewhat trending ops guy net, still kind of looking into that one, but it seems pretty legit. But I am not a misogynist, I am not a homophobe, I'm not a racist. People who know me know this, and they don't contest it. There's nothing to contest. And this is what throws the anti-gamer -ga gators out of their stride because they take the terrible, awful actions of a few people who tried to co-opt the movement of trying to find ethics in video game journalism, transparency, and, and the, 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 the end to collusion between journalists and developers. That is what Gamergate is about. It's not about the harassment of women. And I'm going to tell you right now, okay? I've seen many sources critiquing Anita Sarkeesian's work. And I'm sorry, but I agree with them, all right? That has nothing to do with harassing Ms. Sarkeesian. Because she got a death threat from somebody outside of Gamergate, does not, don't paint the rest of us as misogynist. There are f many dangerous flaws in her logic, okay, that basically make her the modern Jack Thompson. And I'm not trying to completely demonize her. I know everybody makes mistakes, but I'm sorry. People that I respect are not looking into this enough. They're not doing the research. You know, developers that have spoken out in support of, of what I consider to be the end of free speech, they troubled me, all right? And really, like, trying to know whether I was even doing the right thing. Two months of, of like, trying to figure, like, am I with the wrong people? Should I be listening to people like Monday Matt? Should I be listening to people like Internet Aristocrat? Should I be retweeting Anadoru Rogue Star Games? Should I be, should I be, am I gonna regret this one day? And 
and I'm not, I'm not, I'm no stranger to controversy. If you, again, if you follow me on Facebook or Twitter, and as many of the people have unfollowed me this year, and, and that's another thing that happened, like a lot of people unfollowed me, seeing my stance on Gamergate, but not really understanding what it was about, just believing whatever BS MSNBC was saying about it, or, or whatever Gawker was saying, or whatever Kotaku, or Polygon, and Game of Sutra, all these increasingly irrelevant sites that have been exposed as frauds, you know, just, you know, I'm not trying to demonize everybody that works for Polygon or Kotaku, but there's some people that need to go, plain and simple, who are, are, are reminding me of what I got into this to begin with. Like, the whole reason I started Joystick Justice League was to fight bad ethics in gaming media. This happened before Gamergate. Gamergate was just the spark that lit the fire for so many of us that were feeling disenfranchised with this whole industry. And I, and I see a bright future ahead. And that's why I want to, I, I, I had to like press record and get my voice out there. Cause I want to tell people like Leigh Alexander and Steven Totillo that no, gamers aren't dead. They're very much alive, more alive than I could ever think of. Gamergate it made me, Please don't get offended, atheists, but gave me a new respect for atheists, all right? As a Christian, I could find an atheist that I could agree with about something else other than religion. About, we could, I could, I, I have new friends who are, who are gay, who are black, who are transgendered, who are Asian, who are this, who are that. All these people that I met through Gamergate, which completely defies what the mass media tries to demonize it as. That is just a bunch of white cis, cisgendered, I love that effing term, Ugh. thanks South Park for making fun of it. But anyway, just a bunch of white cis shit beard males, I'm trying not to swear too much, but I had to say the S word once, really try not to swear as much with JGL. But anyway, if you really did follow the movement like I did for like the last two months, you would understand that it, the, all the hype was wrong, that g gaming is very much alive. And, and, and I, I'm just I'm just proud to be one of them because, come on, people! Like I'm 34 years old. I came up during the NES era. Okay, I my earliest memories were my cousin's Atari 2600, which was the hot toy. But I was too young to really figure out the mechanics. It wasn't until Super Mario Brothers came out when I was five years old that video gaming grabbed me, and then I got my brother into it. And then, you know, some a lot of you youngsters who who are into gaming now weren't there for the dark days when people like myself growing up, we couldn't talk about video games on the schoolyard. We were outcasts, okay? It's not like today where it's still kind of a geeky thing to do, but nobody can really say they're not a gamer because every damn person I know plays some type of mobile game on their phone. So we're all technically gamers, but some of us are more hardcore than other casuals. There's no wrong, there's no right. Some people are cinephiles versus casual movie viewers. Some people are casual comic book readers versus hardcore. There's always two camps, but man, Gamergate, it's, it's just so diverse. So di so many different personalities, so many different views that reject the collusion that was happening between the journalists and developers that reject people like Jack Thompson and Anita Sarkeesian and all the cultural Marxists who are trying to shut down our hobby and, and saying that all video games are violent and sexist when they completely set up these straw man arguments that ignore all of the positive female protagonists that are out there that are just maybe not triple A games but still exist in the market, on a store shelf, in a Steam store, in a PlayStation store, an Xbox Live Marketplace. That is what a straw man argument is. Ignoring the fact that some people find Bayonetta empowering versus just the one-sided narrative that she's controlled by the male gaze. You know, this could be another argument. I got about three minutes left till the break. The point is, is that that's my stance on Gamergate. I don't want to, again, I don't stand for death threats. I don't stand for misogyny, harassment of women. I believe, again, the things that happened to people like Zoe Quinn and Anita Sarkeesian and Brandon Wu are deplorable, okay? Nobody supports that within Gamergate. Again, you gotta know that any radical movement is gonna get co-opted at some point, and that's what happened. It's thankfully survived a little battered and bruised, but it still marches forth. But hey, 
Ask the people of Occupy Wall Street what happened to their movement, okay, after it got co-opted and basically smeared in the mainstream media. All right, so Gamergate happened, you know my stance on it, but at some point, even to the Gamergaters, I love you all, but you gotta understand that at some point, guys, there's a time for sending emails, and there's a time to play video games, all right? And that's what I'm trying to get back to, the love of the hobby that I've been defending my whole life against everybody else, you know, Again, the dark days of, you know, getting bullied on the schoolyard because, oh, you're just a dork who plays Nintendo and little PC games, you know, and we have something to be proud of. And, and to not only know that, it's not just white males sitting in their basement anymore. Gamers are everywhere. And, it, and, and the future is beautiful, people. Sometimes maybe we do need a day of armistice where we can just come together and celebrate the fact that arguably video gaming is bigger than movies. Think about it. Think about it. Which is the bigger industry now? Video games have taken over. Movies are going to be to the 21st century what theater was to the 20th. All right? So just take that and cruise with it. So back to JJL. JJL, in the interest of transparency, is an aggregate of news. Okay? I'm not, I don't live in California. I don't have any ties to developers yet. I hope to change that. I know there's a lot of developers here in Canada I could possibly re reach out to. I'm not big enough. I don't think most people are going to talk to me yet. But at this point, I I follow all the gaming trades. If Almost all. I, I can never follow all of them, but I keep finding new ones every day. And, you know, it's kind. Of, I watch a lot of InfoWars. I'll be transparent about that too. And I'm trying to kind of take cues from shows like that in terms of how to deliver the news in a, in a fun way. But not, you know, I'm not into like you know, start talking about conspiracy theories. It's about fact here. Anything I talk about, and even if I do talk about a conspiracy in gaming, it's always gonna be backed up by headlines and sources. So, you know, I know that a lot of you, you know, baiters out there try to find people, but you gotta remember I've got research methodology. I'm not gonna promise I'm always gonna be right. You know, always like, you know, sources can be sources, but I'm gonna do the best to get you as accurate information as I can cross-reference with many sources. That's the best I can offer at this point because what else is there? Honesty, truth, and judgment. That's it. So that's what JGL is all about. Stay tuned. We're going to come back more for more. Like I said, JGL Live is a new weekly show. It's about an hour long. Not only talking about my thoughts in that, you know, that segment called the Greek Speaks, but uh, also talking about multi-platform news and general news, starting with some Nintendo news after the break, getting caught up to speed with N Nintendo Direct, and kind of like an upswing in Nintendo's fortune. So stay tuned. We'll be back. I'm Mike Ferruccio for the Joystick Justice League. This is JGL Live. See you in a bit. Welcome back, Joystick Justice League, to part two of episode one of my new show, JJO Live, which is essentially the, like I was saying in, in part one, essentially the new direction of the of the network going forward. I mean, I want to take this back, now that I'm on my own doing this purely solo, I want to take it back to my roots of when I was doing campus radio, just me, a microphone, just kind of talking to myself and uh, my virtual audience. So this is bare bones. I may be adding video to these segments eventually if I have time, but right now at least I want to make this more audio friendly so it can be enjoyed on, on podcasts everywhere. So the last uh, 40 minutes of this show, 40, 45 minutes, is going to be dedicated to Nintendo news, Sony news, Microsoft news, and then finally third party PC mobile and everything else because this is really a console friendly show. Not to say I'll never talk about mobile or PC, but the focus will always be consoles, and if there's a PC version, I'll mention it. Or if there's really something heavy hitting on PC, I'll likely talk about it. But I'm more of a console gamer myself, so I'm going to talk about what I know. So let's start with Nintendo. We're going to do about 10 minutes of Nintendo news, and there's a lot of news. Um, two major things. First of all, if you've been reading the financial reports, Nintendo's actually up, okay? So they've actually posted a profit, which is awesome for them. The only catch is that sales are down, but as I 
kind of go over what's been happening to Nintendo over the last month or so, you'll kind of understand why their profits are up, sales are down, but why this is it's a good thing for them in the short term. Not so sure about the long term, but this will get them to the holiday season and probably most of next year. So Nintendo Direct happened on November 5th. And that really was, even though it wasn't really exciting in terms of revealing new IPs, I mean, there we, we got to see more of Captain Toad Treasure Tracker. We finally got to see a little bit more of Xenogears, Chronicle X, and um, Kirby, and a few other things. But overall, Nintendo Direct on November 5th was more about outlining Nintendo's strategy going forward for the next 6 to 12 months. And it's essentially a more dialed back, working with what we've got kind of approach, which I think is smart because it's, it's less risky in the short term, can help them possibly incrementally build a new audience and maybe push Xbox One, which is ailing right now, right into the tertiary, making it like the, the turbo graphics to the Super Nintendo of PS4 and the Genesis of Wii U. I don't know if it could end up being that way. I think it's gonna be more of a close race, but we'll, we'll see. We'll get into Xbox news later, but let's focus on Nintendo right now. So. What is Nintendo doing right? Let's always start with the sweet side to the sour. Let's start with the sweet here. And what is, is Nintendo doing right right now? So first of all, it sold 1.1 million consoles over the last six compared to 460,000 the same time last year. Uh, time reports in terms of actual dollars, $224 million profit versus a $75 million loss this la this time last year. So that's that's sick. Shareholders are happy, especially that Satoru Iwata who was fighting a tumor actually managed to recover and came back, although a little frail, came back to give the Nintendo Direct himself, which was pretty awesome to see. So, sales are good, and that's been spurred pretty much by Mario Kart. I mean, 47% attach rate. You know, it's, it's, I'm not giving you a lot of breaking news here. It's a bit, again, it's been a while since I've recorded, but these things need to be addressed, because we need to understand what, what Nintendo's trying to do from every aspect. So, Mario Kart, huge attach rate. Hyrule Warriors, a surprise, uh, at least not a, not a critical surprise. I mean, it, got, it did okay review-wise, but commercially, it's been on the charts. Like, it, it, like when Destiny was dominating the charts during September, Hyrule Warriors was right up there too. Like, it was selling better than I think uh, people expected because that's the thing. Wii U owners are starved for exclusives. You could put anything with a reskin right now, and I think most Wii U owners would gobble it up. I mean, I'm not trying to detract from Hyrule Warriors. I'm sure it's a fun game. It's just not a Zelda game. So, but you know, it's still good. Bayonetta 2 defied the odds. Critical darling. I don't know. It's, it's doing okay commercially, but I think word of mouth is going to really push that game. And, and again, it just it just shows that. Yeah, Nintendo may not be putting out as many games as as Xbox is and as Sony, or at least what they're promising to put out. But they're just putting out less and making it more. So they're 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 kind of like they're they're scaling down their efforts and and kind of and I would say slow cooking their games, like just making sure that they maximize everything. And that's really the reason. And also with the weak yen and kind of inflating overseas sales, but the reason why profits up or sales are down because now they're not spending as many development dollars on developing all these new IPs, but rather don't just taking all those resources and fine focusing them on each of these flagship titles to ensure that they're gonna be at least an 80 minute critic score and, and are gonna go out, but also that they have long-term attachment. I mean, Iwata was basically saying that their philosophy going forward is to say, okay, you finish Mario Kart, there's still more content for you to enjoy. We, we can extend that replay, replayability of that one title to make it iconic and legendary rather than something like Destiny, which I fear is already becoming a flavor of the month, which is kind of sad to see that, and we'll get into this later too, the fact that like a, game, a big game like Destiny is already calling for a sequel um, because of just lackluster perception. You're just not seeing that with Nintendo right now. So for the short term, it's great. And of course you've got Smash Brothers to carry Nintendo sailing through Christmas. I mean, Smash Brothers is gonna be ridiculous, especially now that they've given that game-changing reason for people to buy it. Because when the 3DS version came out and, and people gobbled it up, all of a sudden, people were starting to say, well, you know, are they still, people still gonna get that Wii U version? Are they gonna, you know, are they gonna double dip? And then finally, Nintendo announces eight-player competitive Smash Brothers. Like, game changer right there. Like, they, they've, they've gotten better 
at taking small little announcements and inflating them. And, that, and, and that's a good tactic for the short term. But like I said a few months ago on a round table when, we were, when Joe and I were talking about um, the post E3, re, our post E3 reactions to Nintendo and feeling that all the hype was a little inflated, I think with the lack of third party support, Nintendo will do okay overall, but with sales being down, it's going to be really hard for them to hit that bank like they hit in the Wii days. I mean, it's going to take another generation for them to recover. And because now the PS4 and the Xbox One are starting to hit their stride, and PC gaming, which is the next level, is already becoming more affordable by the, by the day, I don't know how much longer Wii U can ride this piggybacking wave they're on where it's like, okay, now we're going to put out DLC for Mario Kart. Now, for the first time ever, you're going to see a DLC for Mario game. Or now we're going to send sell Amiibo toys at $13 a pop just so you can have a new skin or like in your in your Mario Kart or like a new weapon in Hyrule Warriors. At some point, the parents are going to draw the line. You know, they, they, you've got Skylanders, which is which is already omnipresent, and now you've got the the new what's it the trap um, trap team or something like that. Skylanders is already huge. Parents have already invested hundreds of dollars into not only that, but now Disney Infinity 2.0, which is selling really well, and that's starting to sell figures. Our parents and kids who have no money at all, and the parents that already have limited funds, are they going to shell out for now a third line? of NFC toys just because they add a little perk to a game and like try being a kid and explaining to your dad it's like oh I want to buy a $13 Zelda doll that adds a sword into Hyrule Warriors I'm going to use for 10 minutes I I, I don't know man I, I, I don't think this is the right approach I think they're going to get lost in this whole kind of this move to toys maybe I'm going to be wrong maybe maybe it'll sell like hotcakes maybe parents will find that extra dollar they can use to spend towards these toys but you know, you're already starting to see the backlash towards microtransactions and DLC and seasons passes in general. Like, it's getting greedy. It's get it's getting abused in many cases. Like, look at uh, the the controversy right now with Assassin's Creed Unity and having to, I, I think it was like buy an app or something to unlock content in the game and. You know, just just the fact that you have to pay sixty dollars alone in this tight economy for a game. Now it's it, it, any game, any game out there. If you want to get the complete experience, it goes upwards to like a hundred, hundred and twenty dollars, and that's a lot to ask of people. So wow, like that's ten minutes already. So this is you know I may have to give Nintendo. A, I'm gonna go an extra five minutes with this segment because Nintendo deserves a little bit more time. We're gonna extend this segment to fifteen minutes. We're gonna keep going for a few more minutes here. Um. It's, it's really time to just bite the bullet and to announce the next-gen handheld. I think they've done so well with the 3DS, and I think that with all the great games that are still coming out for it, like the recently announced, uh, what was the um, this, this fantastic codename Steam, which is going to be from the makers of Fire Emblem and Advance Wars, which is going to be kind of like this XCOM-like uh, turn-based strategy, which looks fantastic. And, and you've got uh, already this fantastic library of 3DS. I think around E3 is the time to announce a next-gen handheld and that's going to do uh, it's I want, I, want, I want to figure out where I want to go over the last five minutes here this is about as real as it gets folks in terms of how I'm going to do the news I may stutter once in a while but um, before I move on to the next-gen handheld, let's get back to this in the last few minutes let's let's finish this off so Nintendo's piggybacking they're taking a slower approach it's working in the short term my fear, the last thing I want to say about this, my fear is that as the PS4 and Xbox One hit their stride in 2015 and 16 and beyond, the Wii U is going to age badly, okay? Already we're seeing early footage of Uncharted 4. It's ridiculous, all right? Halo 5 is most likely by the time it's ready going to be ridiculous, all right? Metal Gear Solid Phantom Pain, Arkham Knight, Mortal Kombat X, none of these games, some of them exclusive, some of them not exclusive, but none are showing up on the Wii U. That is troubling to me because what do Wii U owners have to look forward to next year? They got Zelda. That's huge, but Captain Toad. That's not huge. It's good. It looks amazing. It's not huge. And 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 uh, what's it? The the uh, the the Kirby game. Um, what's it called? I wrote it down here. 
Uh, Kirby, Kirby, Kirby. Kirby and the Rainbow Curse. Yeah, not bad. You know, cute. Pretty good, but not a huge year. Like, not a lot. I'm, I'm hoping we'll see a big announcement around January, February, but this is why I want to use the last few minutes to talk about what I think they need to do. And I think next summer, they need to start announcing that next-gen handhold. And, and if I were in charge of things, here's where I would give you some advice, Nintendo, of what you should be doing. First of all, you need something that looks as good, if not better, than what the Vita can do natively, okay? The, native, the Vita can do almost PS3 level. If you can make something that has like almost like Wii U level graphics on a handheld, but better, like it's gotta be better. Just slightly better. And it's gotta be, you've gotta be able to take that handheld and beam it to your TV so you can stream that stuff on Twitch. So that's one thing I would do. I would definitely make it connect to your TV, but also built-in streaming. I think Nintendo's gotta change its focus on streaming. I think it's one of the greatest ways to find out about video games. And again, in this era of like, going back to Gamergate, of suspect ethics and transparency, and, and already, like even, it's, it's, it happens every day. Like look what happened with Shadow of Mordor. That game was great, but you know, anybody who's promoting it had a certain set of rules of how to promote it, and it's just, it just, it's not transparent. So what Twitch does is it, increases that focus on transparency. It, it, it allows early adopters to, to show off the game, whether they like it or not, and for people to judge for themselves, to watch an extended play session to see, like, is this a game I wanna play? I think Nintendo would only benefit themselves, not only by putting streaming into like a next generation, next gen portable or next gen hardware, but start with this one. Start getting the Wii U, put a Twitch app on the Wii U, seriously. Figure out some way to get Nintendo or to, to get Nintendo players onto Twitch, onto Ustream, promoting your games, and that's what's really going to build up that loyal fan base that's going to take you into the next generation whenever that starts for them. So I I'm hoping to see good things. I really do, but like I said before, to kind of finish off for the last minute here of the Nintendo segment, I think management's got to shake up. I they they need they need some new blood in Nintendo. A new type of visionary. I, I respect Iwata. I respect Fiza Mae to a certain degree. They've done certain things right, but they've done a lot of things wrong. And in terms of Reggie Fiza Mae, he really needs to kind of wake up and realize that Nintendo's not King of the Hill anymore. When he says outlandish things that, like, that sound outlandish, maybe not, that'll sound outlandish later. Like, when he says that the PS4 and the Xbox One are, are, are identical and have no franchises that could be ever as, as iconic as the Nintendo, he, he's talking corporate puffery, okay? It's just, it's not, it, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, the, the PS4 and the Xbox One are in the first year of their life cycles, but wait, just wait until the next couple of years when they do hit their stride and leave the Wii U in the dust. Y you gotta start showing some signs of, uh, like, Reggie, you, like, your head's in the clouds, man. You, you, you really need to understand that stream is a good thing, the competition is is out circling you right now, and you're getting lucky, and, and it's really just time to start making peace with the third parties and, and, and just try to get some unique experiences outside of your own tentpole. So, wow, that's Nintendo. 10 minutes, 15 minutes actually we went to. We're gonna stay, stay tuned for the uh, very nervous, but, uh, you know, Long awaited, at least by myself, episode of uh, the first episode of JJL Live. This has been part two. Part three is coming up next. Running down Sony news, what they've been doing right, what they've been doing wrong. I'm Mike Frusios for the Joystick Justice League. Stay tuned, we'll be back after this. Welcome back, Joystick Justice League, to part three of the debut episode of JJO Live, the new show, new direction for the Joystick Justice League with your host here, Mike Frusios, doing it solo. So going back to my roots, when I used to do campus radio, just doing it and basically like a live read, reading the news, talking about headlines and just, you know, having some fun with some commentary, some punditry and some uh, good old fashioned podcastery, if that's a, a term. So let's get into some Sony news. We just came back from Nintendo in the last segment. 
got about half an hour left in this debut episode so we're still we still got microsoft to cover and third parties let's go for the next 10 minutes with sony news of course, everybody knows that so the PS4 is leading the charge in the eighth generation right now. The sales show it, 12.4 million units sold so far. It's an incredible first year for Sony, completely turned around the brand. Is, 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 it hasn't quite turned around Sony as a whole. I mean, they, overall, even though PS4 is doing really well for Sony and actually kind of creating a profit, their mobile division is failing miserably. I'm gonna to get to something in a sec that may fix that, but it really depends on whether providers are gonna take the bait. But anyway, the PlayStation brand is healthy, and that's without really having any major exclusives this Christmas. I mean, you can't really argue that Little Big Planet 3 is like a system seller or anything like that. They're really going on the strength of the PlayStation Network and all the third-party games that have a better, slightly better resolution or and or frame rate than their Xbox counterparts. But in terms of exclusives, I mean, really, I mean, you're up against Master Chief Collection and Sunset Overdrive on the Xbox. You're up against Smash Brothers, Bayonetta 2, Hyrule Warriors, Mario Kart for the Wii U. I mean, it's it's lopsided. But here's the thing that, like, like how, how does that work? You know, how does that work that, that, that Sony's the leading console without even having a major exclusive? It comes down to one major thing. Consumer confidence, all right? They, they turn their game around from the PS3 generation and, and and much earlier than people give them credit for. And it all started with their incredible attitude towards the next generation of game developers, which I've been talking about for so long. Their incredible warming, like hands-off attitude, but supportive attitude towards indies that has resulted in some truly incredible partnerships. Just looking already at some of the stuff that's come out for the PS3 and PS4 on the indie marketplace and stuff that's slated to come out, like and, and especially their, their pretty much exclusive deal with Devolver Digital, which is becoming a giant in the industry, in the indie industry, things are looking bright for the Sony brand, but consumer confidence. They came out swinging and hit and hit all the right hit all the right notes when they revealed the PS4, the the whole hands off stance on DRM, again the the attitude towards indies, the the horsepower, the fact that all this press has been coming out about you know how you know certain third party games don't perform as well on the Xbox One compared to the PS4. It's just it's just been positive press, and I'm not saying Nintendo's I mean sorry Sony's done everything 100 percent right over the last year. I mean, they we're going to get into some of the sour stuff of what's been happening to Sony, but overall, they've poised themselves for when the generation truly takes hold. I mean, anybody who follows video game consoles throughout the years always knows that the first year is kind of like a hodgepodge mixed bag of of like some great titles, mostly okay titles and some real stinkers. That's just expected. So, you know, you get a lot of pundits out there and, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of fear mongers who, who always talk about, oh, the PS4 is underpowered and the Xbox One's underpowered and, oh, they won't compare to PCs and they won't, this generation will be shorter than the last. This, this episode is too short to talk about cloud processing and I think I'm going to make that a few, if you, we're probably going to talk about that next week, actually. That'll be maybe an episode of The Greek Speaks or, or maybe a week after. We'll talk about cloud processing, processing soon enough and how that's going to affect the eighth generation. But... Already, with games like Call of Duty Advanced Warfare, I can't believe I'm saying this, because Call of Duty was always kind of like, graphically, like a decent looking game, but now it's become one of the best looking games of the year. Like, I was playing the, I just finished the campaign the other day on the PS4, and some of those cutscenes are, are just stupid, like ridiculously, like amazing. Like, anybody talking about that the PS4 or even the Xbox One, which is, has a slightly lower resolution than the PS4 version, that these consoles are underpowered. I don't know what they're playing. And, and the other lie from the PC elitist, the other straw man argument that they're always throwing up is that, oh, it's so cheap to get a 4K capable gaming rig. I'm like, yeah, if you want to play it like minimal settings. Like that, that's always the part that PC elitists always forget to mention that if you actually do want to play at max settings, you will have to put a little bit of money in. I've done my shopping around and I know what my budget is and mo most people's budgets are. Consoles are still cheaper overall and, and they're simpler to work with and you and what you get is what you get. But anyway, I'm getting into something else. I want to talk about Sony. I've got about six minutes left, six or seven minutes left for this this segment. They're doing okay, all right? Now, they're, like I said, their mobile division is suffering. One little tidbit of uh, information I do want to share, you may, because most of you probably don't even follow Sony's mobile division, I, I understand, they don't promote it very well, but the new Xperia 
is, is interesting, okay? The new Xperia Z3, I think it's either coming out or is out already, has remote play built in, all right? So this is a true PlayStation phone in the sense that you can actually play your PS4 on your phone and it's and it's cool because it's actually gonna have a little clip that you hook to your DualShock 3 or your DualShock 4 and it's actually gonna put your phone in landscape mode above your controller so you can just play like this, right? Or I think it, it, you can attach your tablet but I don't know how that's gonna wear like the weight of it but regardless, I've, I've seen early reviews of it and, and one guy was actually playing Crucible on it and he didn't show too much gameplay footage, but he attested, uh, I think I have the link of, of who actually said it, it was lifehacker.com.au that actually makes the claim that Destiny's Crucible plays with virtually no lag on the Z3, whereas on the Vita, there is a lot of lag. You know, the, the remote play is okay. I mean, you can play stuff like Mercenary Kings, like slower paced stuff like The Binding of Isaac or whatever, but... You know, for fast-paced, twitchy stuff, the remote play doesn't cut it on the Vita at this point with Wi-Fi the way it is, or maybe, I don't know, I'm not an engineer, but I don't think the Vita can handle remote play the way they envisioned it, but it seems like this Z3 has more horsepower into the hood. It can actually handle a, a, a more latency-free, lag-free experience, so it remains to be seen, but unfortunately, it comes down to providers. I mean, here in Canada, the only way you can get your hands on one is through Bell. I mean, Rogers doesn't even want to carry it. They're, they're just do Samsung and iPhones and all that fun stuff, so it, they don't promote it very well. You know, I don't see a lot of marketing outside of niche markets, so hopefully that'll turn things around, but I've got a few minutes left to talk about Sony. While things may be rosy, you know, they've been having some problems too, you know. Let's talk about, let's wrap up this year and some of the problems so we can actually look to next year and where things might get rosy again. But Drive Club, wow, what a disaster. I mean, I'm really feeling for the guys at Evolution what happened to these guys and I'm really fearing for the company as a whole because Evolution has had a troubled few years. I mean, if you've been following the company that's that put out Drive Club, their last game was MotorStorm Apocalypse, and if you were following what happened, um, you know that that was a disaster. Because what it was supposed to launch, and then the uh, the tsunami in Japan happened, and they couldn't market it because they were they were afraid that people would find it offensive or insensitive or something like that. You know, again, you know, see there you go. You know, people getting offended by everything. This is why I get so mad that people just get offended over the dumbest shit. Like, you know, I would be the last person to get offended that a video game came out at the same time, you know, as a natural disaster. I mean, I'm just, and, and look and look what happened. I mean, they, they, they lost so much money on that game. The game did not sell. They lost a whole bunch of money, and now look what happened to Drive Club. Supposed to be a launch game for the PS4, got delayed by a year, and now it comes out and they still can't make it work. And this isn't the only case of this happening. Just this week, Master Chief Collection dropped on Tuesday, and already they're having matchmaking issues. And, and there's similar, st and there's been other games that have been affected by this too. But I don't know, man. Drive Club's a special case. Something like Master Chief Collection, I know, will be patched in about a week. Already, Call of Duty, people were complaining about it at launch, saying, "Oh, there was lag issues in the multiplayer and and frame rate issues and stuff," and it got fixed in a week. I think this is just something that we're gonna have to deal with while everybody's catching up on internet service. But Drive Club is a special case where I think Evolution just got too ambitious, didn't really have a clearly defined idea that you could describe in a sentence. And I can't remember, I wish I could find the video, but somebody put that very elegantly. It's, I think it might've even been Colin Moriarty on Podcast Beyond who said that it, it, you can't describe that game in one sentence. And I think that's where it failed to capture the imagination. So. I'm really praying that they can fix the server issues on that game and get it on on Plus, and that might give it a rejuvenation, especially if they cut the price to like maybe 40 bucks and try to get out the door. It might have a second life in 2015, but overall, flop, man. So I'm, I'm kind of best wishes to Evolution, but I think with two flops in a row like this, uh, future's not looking bright. I hope they can turn this around, but uh, give them some time. Uh, also, Wrapping up Sony news, before we kind of touch on 2015, SharePlay is not exactly what they thought it was going to be. But again, I just want—I really want to address fear mongering here because, yes, yeah, sorry, Call of Duty, you got the news. People are freaking out that Call of Duty, you can't do SharePlay with it. And there's uh, about 13 other games, including Tomb Raider, Fez, Call of Duty Ghosts, Hotline Miami, and you can check the list for yourself. 
that don't use the share play function. And essentially one of the developers on Call of Duty explained that, all right, well, you know, at the time we were developing this game, we didn't really have access to this feature. But in this day and age, it's something that can be very easily patchable back in. And Sony's even already clarified that this is something that the developers can choose to put in their game. They're not mandated to do it. And, and it sounds like it's just something that's gonna be patched in. So again, with all the fear mongers that take, that do this clickbaiting and jump all over these headlines as if they're actual real news, I think we have to accept the reality that one thing that's gonna happen in the at least the early part, if not the whole part of the eighth generation, while connection speeds are all over the place and in their infancy, is that we're gonna have to expect that a lot of games are, are gonna require some patches day one. I mean, we're, we're just dealing with a new platform, we're dealing with a new generation, there's always gonna be hiccups, but it doesn't mean that a game is broken. I mean, for every Battlefield 4, there's 10 other games that do get patched within a week, so just try to, try to relax, people. Just watch your blood pressure. You know, I'm sure Master Chief Collection, in about a week's time, you guys will be playing that like crazy. There'll be no matchmaking issues. Just enjoy the games. Stop getting worked up over, over, over headlines and clickbaiting and just breathe, breathe. We'll be back, all right, with some Microsoft news in a bit. Stay tuned. Welcome back, Joystick Justice League, to the debut episode of our new central show, JJL Live, where I, Mike Frizios, every weekend cover the best headlines of the week. This episode's a bit special. Not only was it like two months in the making, and some of this news is maybe a couple weeks old or whatever, but we're getting caught up, getting back into a groove. I mean, it took me long enough just to get back on camera and start talking in front of it again, so you know, bear with me here. But as we get into like a weekly groove, we're gonna stay on top of the weekly news. So let's focus on Microsoft, what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong, get up to speed with what, what's been going down the last couple of months. Firstly, uh, big news for holidays, you know, now that they've got some killer exclusives like the Master Chief Collection and Sunset Overdrive, of course, Xbox lot, X, the Xbox One bundles and standalones are all dropping temporarily till January 3rd by $50. Now, people are mixed on this, how much of a positive effect it's gonna have I don't know, you know, it, like I think the Xbox brand is still stronger than a lot of people give it credit for. I mean, people still have their live networks, are still enticed to get the games. And really, I mean, with all the all the clickbaiting and fear mongering over resolution and frame rates that goes back and forth about, you know, Xbox One games not looking as nice uh, as the PS4 counterparts in, in terms of where the third party games stand, I don't see the consumer caring. I see people buying uh, versions of Destiny for Xbox One and PS4. You know, yeah, the PS4 is doing better sales-wise, but the Xbox One is slowly catching up, and it has the momentum of the holiday season to use Master Chief Collection and Sunset Overdrive to their advantage to maybe start catching up a little bit. But the other part of me says that 50 bucks, well, the damage has been done. I, 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 I still see a lot of the bad press that Microsoft got over the last year coming back to haunt them, the, the whole no DRM thing, the, the this kind of snotty, dismissive attitude they still harbor towards indies. And I mean, wow, this sweet list could completely turn sour, but let's be honest here, uh, I'm not impressed with a lot of the things that still aren't being addressed. I mean, I recently read that Phil Spencer is still defending the parody clause for, for when he was on the Inner Circle podcast there, um, I, I gotta switch gears here because I mean, really, let's 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 talk about the reality of this price drop. You know, people aren't stupid. People follow some type of gaming trade anywhere. Like more and more, even non-gaming sites are covering gaming news, like the International Business Times, Reuters. So the, the news gets out there quicker than it ever did before. And when they're still defending this whole dumb parity clause, whereby if an indie game decides, an indie developer, sorry, decides to release their game on the PlayStation or the Wii before they do it on the Xbox One that they can't do it all of a sudden. It has to either come out on all platforms at the same time or Xbox first and then they can review this on a case-by-case -case basis. It's no surprise that you're gonna get like the developers of Titan Souls saying that 
Sony is our preferred platform. We just like, and I'd say, like I said earlier uh, in the show, I believe that uh, Devolver Digital as a whole has pretty much taken a pro Sony anti Xbox stance from the beginning. And that's really going to hurt Xbox in the long run that a lot of these indies are favoring Sony over Xbox. Not all of them. I mean, Double Fine is kind of taking an either or stance, you know, doing certain games for Xbox, certain games for PlayStation. But, um, I think just again, like, you know, bad press can stick for a long time. And, and you know, it's it's great that Master Chief Collection is a, a hot property right now. You know, it's it's obviously got a few online issues this week, which will be patched, so stop believing all the haters who say, Oh, it's it's fucked and it's it's I'm sorry, I didn't mean to swear there. I'm probably gonna beat that out later, maybe leave it, I don't know. Um It's still a remastered collection of last gen games. Let's 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 get past the hype here. Really, I mean, it's not like a new IP. It's just a better looking version of of something everybody's had before. So I just I, I I see it selling consoles, but I don't see it being that that crown jewel. I don't know. I I, I want it, but it still isn't enough to plunk down five hundred dollars for another console and pay for a subscription service. So I, I hope that turns around because it really the 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 whole major pain in my butt about Microsoft for like the last decade has been their their willingness to devote time and energy to stupid things like timed exclusives and, and DLC and and especially with Call of Duty Last Gen when they wasted so much money on getting that on that timed exclusive content DLC for Call of Duty whereas Sony was spending its time and resources much like Nintendo is now on fostering its developers and its talent and developing franchises that would carry them into the next generation. That's what Sony did right. That's what Microsoft did wrong. And now it's showing. You know, it's like, yes, they have all the third party games at maybe a slightly lower resolution than the PS4 does. And that's great. But in terms of exclusives, when the gate starts to open, the floodgates start to open for Sony next year, Microsoft's going to be in trouble because not only do you have Uncharted, but you've got Ratchet and Clank make a reappearance, God of War, which I know is going to get announced at some point. Gran Turismo, you've got all these other franchises that they can mine, you know, that, 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 that have been in place since the days of PS2, PS3, where again, last gen, it wasn't so much about franchises with Xbox, but it was about the whole experience, and I think that's where you're seeing them lacking right now. So, $50 price cut, is it going to move consoles? I hope so. I'd like to see things catch up. I'd like to see this be a neck and neck generation. But, uh, you know, let's get back to some good stuff. Um, 343 is taking advantage of the of basically the boon of esports and now has actually created their own Halo Championship Series or HCS for short which is actually the first developer run league in association with Twitch, ESL and Microsoft. The initial focus is going to be on Halo 2 but they've already promised that more of the I believe more of the Master Chief Collection will be available in addition to Halo 5 and they've already announced Halo 6. So yeah like is the Microsoft, is the Xbox becoming a niche console? Are they banking too much on, on Master Chief? I, I know he has a following, but I'm just wondering it, how much more relevant Halo's going to be in the face of Destiny 2 and the new mechanics of Call of Duty Advanced Warfare and, and the impending Titanfall 2, which I know is going to get announced, which is most likely going to go multi plat now because EA now owns the Titanfall license. I, I hope they can really innovate. Already, like early reports are like from like I was listening to podcast on Locked earlier today. Ryan McCaffrey was mentioning that Halo Five isn't playing so hot. It's not feeling that great. Again, it's very early in development, but you'd expect they that they would try to at least get something better out the door. I don't know. Well, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter. You know, Halo is Halo. It's always going to sell consoles. And, and copies what they really need to focus on in 2015 is starting to nurture more second party relationships and getting more and getting rid of that damn parody clause to try to entice indies and really going full blown like indies i've said this so many times before indies represent the next generation like they are going to be the next naughty dog they are going to be the next bioware the, the some of the indies we're playing these like these lower scale games we're playing now these, these people are going to be making the next AAA. So you, you have to start developing good relationships. And, and I want to see Phil Spencer start to fight back against this whole parody clause. I, I think he's got to abolish that and really open the floodgates and, and try to create a more responsive attitude. And, and like I said, I think both companies, both Sony and Xbox, need to get over this DLC war. They need to stop 
going for like exclusive DLC, exclusive content, time exclusives, and just start fostering talent. That that's really the major thing I want to see. Uh, what else can we? We're kind of we're gonna wrap up Xbox in about a minute or so here. What else can we talk about? Um, it's official. Mojang is now officially owned by Microsoft. The 2.5 billion bio is complete. Um, basically, they're saying Microsoft is saying that the cloud service will in, enhance the Minecraft experience. My only issue, again, always being try to be a devil's advocate. I try to look at things from both sides. It's great. Now you're going to have that Microsoft money being injected into the Minecraft franchise, which I think can has already survived long enough without Notch's presence. You know, people like to assume that Notch has been there for the whole ride, but he's he's slow. Like even before he retired from Mojang, he was doing less and less as like 4J was doing more and more. And, and I mean, it's it's it remains to be seen whether they can make like say like I know they're they're all signs are pointing towards a Minecraft two. I think that's what's gonna logically happen. But when you take the figurehead away from the franchise, Notch, Mark Mark's person, is it gonna be the same? Is it gonna have the same soul that the first Minecraft has? Because I I do believe in the auteur theory. I'm a film student, so I do believe that that the work has some is some is in some way a reflection of the artist itself and, and that and that's the thing like when you really get into the deep philosophies of what makes minecraft so incredibly appealing it, it has to when you when you when you when you listen to notch speak when you follow him and you hear his philosophies on life you can see those playing out and, and it's not it's no more blatant than when you actually um my nephew showed me this eli um when you actually go into create mode and you fight the ender dragon you finish it it has this prolonged end credit sequence where it's kind of giving you like this zen philosophy of how to live life and how minecraft all relates to that so the other thing that's on everybody's minds is how does this work now that Minecraft is on PlayStation Vita, PS3, and PS4? Is this going to affect this going to other platforms? Is it going to become an Xbox exclusive and a PC exclusive? Right now they're saying no, but at the same time they're saying Sony can do whatever it wants. So it almost seems, I'm not trying to make any wild predictions, but it's going to seem like I think Sony's going to have to start paying some big bucks to Microsoft if they ever want to see any further updates for Minecraft or to see it expand above where it is now. I don't know. It'll be interesting to see. We run out of time for the uh, Microsoft part of this. Um, stay tuned for the final segment. We're going to try to wrap up the show. Uh, we've gone a little bit long, so I may have to cut down my third party discussion to about five minutes. But uh, stay tuned for that. That'll wrap up uh, this debut episode of JJL Live, the new uh, video game news and reviews and radio, radio style program that is going to be in the new direction going forward. I'm Mike Fricio. Stay tuned. We'll be uh, back soon. Joystick Justice League to the final part of the debut episode of JJL Live. I'm Mike Frusios. This is my new weekly news roundup that I do on the weekends after all the major news is dropped from Monday to Friday. I'm going to dedicate myself to, to putting in one episode a week. Okay, so that's my commitment I'm going to try to make to you now that I've broken that, broken through like the that first hurdle of pressing record, getting my confidence back, and doing a show. I feel like I can do an audio podcast once a week. So that'll be the goal. Round up the headlines, record on the weekend, get it out. So let's finish it up. Uh, this ran a bit longer, so I, was, I wanted to devote a little bit more time to third-party news, which is going to be this last segment. Um, so I've still got about you know five, six minutes left. Let's uh, talk a little bit about BlizzCon, which happened last week. BlizzCon 2014 happened. And, you know, again, this isn't exactly fresh news, but... There, you know, I do want to talk a little bit about it um, from the stance of a console gamer. Now, there's some really exciting stuff on the horizon, and, and I know that Blizzard really takes the console market seriously because I did have the fortune to pick up Diablo 3 Reaper of Souls Ultimate Evil Edition for the PS4 this year, and it's definitely one of my top 10 games of the year. Just polished. I hadn't even played Diablo 3 until this year. I held out because I knew when the PS4 was announced, Diablo 3 was also announced. 
and I knew that it was probably something worth waiting for. So I held out this whole time, and I, needless to say, I was I was far from disappointed. I was actually I it exceeded my expectations of what to expect from a PC port. Kind of in the same way as when XCOM was quote unquote dumbed down for consoles, and actually I think that actually took RTSs in the next logical step. But we'll talk about that some other time. Point is, is that I watched. I'm not even a huge Blizzard fanboy. I, I, people who know me know I'm not like a huge PC gamer. I still follow it out of interest, but I don't have the rig to really run a lot of games at the requirements I want to run. But anyway, I watched the whole 45-minute uh, long opening ceremonies for BlizzCon, which started off a little controversially when Mike Morhaime uh, talked about uh, harassment in the game industry over the last two months. Didn't really mention Gamergate specifically, but Jeff Keighley kind of put some words in his mouth and he was kind of, you know, held it hostage. I'm not really giving any new information. Monday Matt has a good video about that. You can check it out. But anyway, getting all that stuff out of the side, we got back to the games. And, you know, for anybody who's a fan of Blizzard, they hit all the major cylinders, you know. Expansion for World of Warcraft, uh, expansion for Hearthstone, um, updates on uh, the MOBA Heroes of the Storm, which is basically a competitor to Valve's Dota 2, Defense of the Agents 2, and Riot Games' League of Legends, which are both massive games, but you know, when you've got the Blizzard stamp on it and you're using icons of the World of Warcraft franchise, it could be a serious contender. Um, also, big announcement, StarCraft 2. Uh, Legacy of the Void. Now this is one I really want to talk about from a console perspective because it's interesting that they're making this a standalone game. Okay, it's very interesting that you don't have to buy the first two games which were uh, Wings of Liberty and Heart of the Swarm to actually play this and, and they'll probably have some novel way of getting you caught up on what's been happening in the trilogy but you, you can buy this game and they say and enjoy it in its entirety without even having played it. This is, try to, this is to try to introduce new players into the StarCraft franchise and what I'm hoping is that this may eventually lead to some kind of uh, tuned for console StarCraft experience. Like, I, I, I really see now that PS, the PS4 and the Xbox One can handle these online experiences as shown by how successful Destiny worked as an MMO. You know, love or hate the game, it worked, you know, most of the time. You know, it still works very well. And uh, I think that they can start bringing more PC experiences to the consoles. I would love to see something like StarCraft II show up on next-gen consoles. I think that would just make them, they'll, this, this, them sell more. And especially the people who are on the fence, like myself, about buying something like a Steam box or committing to upgrading my graphics card when I know that said graphics card would be obsolete in like three to six months. So anyway, a lot of fun stuff on the horizon, but what really got people stoked at the conference was the reveal of the next IP, which is Overwatch. 17 years in the making, Blizzard now having conquered MMOs and trying to conquer MOBAs and card battling games and you name it, is getting into the first person competitive shooter arena, squad based shooter to be more precise, and to be more even more precise, really the next evolution of games like Team Fortress, down to like the cartoony Pixar style of the graphics, the over-the-top weapons, the characters. I mean, we're talking a lot of classes. I mean, Team Fortress had like, what, maybe five, six classes. I know I'm going to get torn apart for not getting my numbers right, but it, it, it had a good number of classes, whereas this, I'm looking at my list here of things I took in from that from that gameplay video. We've got, we've, we've got teleporters. We've got classes with jetpacks, turrets, wall climbing classes like Titanfall style. Expl explosive arrows, akimbo guns, heavy melee gadgets, heavy weapons, robot that transforms into a sentry gun, this is all stuff I wrote down, angel wings, grapple slash sniper, magic attacks, giant lightning shield hammer. Okay, so um, this is going to beta really soon. This isn't something that's on the horizon for like the end of 2015. Well, I mean, retail it will be, but we're going to get a taste of it much sooner than we think. And what's Awesome is that I got on that boat and signed up for the beta. So hopefully, if my calculations are correct, I think to get interest in this game, Blizzard is going to make this viable on even like the most moderate gaming PC platforms like my own, which only has like what 500 gigs, uh, 500 megs of RAM. It's it's ridiculous. It's stupid. I can run Team Fortress 2 and, and Counter Strike, but that's about it. I can't run any current gen PC games. But this one. I looked at the graphical style, and if I can run this at 60 frames, it may be worth, if I can get my hands on it, doing a future episode. So I'm going to be following Overwatch. This is, it's not exactly like a game changer that I was thinking it might be, but it's got, it's, it's, it's knowing Blizzard and, and their quality control 
and their commitment to their consumers, my expectations are high. And we'll be tracking this game throughout the weeks as more gets revealed about it and we get closer to the beta. We've pretty much run out of time already. Uh, I wanted to talk about um, a, uh, something else about Dennis Diak's uh, return with Shadow of the Immortals. Uh, sorry, Shadow of the Eternals is actually back on. We're going to bump that maybe to next week. And um, also, just one quick thing, GTA 5 is coming out for PS4 and Xbox One on the 18th. You can watch me stream it uh, from the 18th and beyond on twitch.tv forward slash 24 Bay Heroes. That's my gaming channel on Twitch. I'll be streaming that uh, from launch day onwards. But I was on the fence about GTA 5 because obviously so little was being revealed about it. But man, if you've seen the first person trailer, bang, there it is. Like the reason to even re like. The whole reason I was going to buy GTA 5 again, even though I've already beaten it and I've already put in like so many hours of the online, was because the online was so hit or miss on the PS3. I wanted to play more of it and I got sick of getting kicked out of the game and having to reload the game. I'm hoping that the online is going to be better. And I, and I already sense it's going to be because they've promised 30 player matches, which means that they're probably feeling pretty confident about the way, that especially the PS4, can now handle the online nature of this very ambitious game. But just the fact that you can play the whole game in down the sights, cover based first person, with these new enhanced graphics is just a game changer to me. Like that's just a new way of playing the game. It's like a new way of looking at it, new way of strategizing it. So I'm really excited. I hope you are too. I'm gonna be playing it on Twitch. That's it, man. That's it. That's all I can talk about. There's so much more I didn't get to talk about this week, but there's always next week and always the new headlines that are going to be coming out. So uh, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Hope you enjoyed the uh, the new direction of the Joystick Justice League and, and kind of like how it center out, centers around this show and with specialty shows. So I'm Mike Frucios doing this solo now. Just me, a microphone, some headlines, some commentary, some wits, a little bit of cynicism, but always truth, transparency, and respect. So, again, stop hating on Gamergate. Get your, fa get your facts straight. Keep things credible, people. And for the God's sakes, just, just love what you do. Love the games. I'm getting all preachy now. I gotta stop this. So, uh, we'll see you again next week, guys. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Mike Frucios, Joystick Justice League. Oh, peace and game on.